Greetings, I am Bill Maynard, Vice Chair of the ICAO Meteorology Panel and Meteorologist and an Aviation Safety Inspector. I invite you to join me in Montreal this December for GANIS 2, the second Global Air Navigation Industry Symposium. Together, industry and state representatives will build a common vision and set goals for an improved and seamless global aviation system. The outcome of GANIS 2 will be a key consideration for the 13th Air Navigation Conference in October 2018, where key milestones will be set. Meteorological services are undergoing fundamental changes and improvements to provide both safety and efficiency benefits. We can, today, provide a tremendous amount of high quality weather information at a high resolution in both time and space and tailor it to flight specific planning and decision making requirements. Going forward, we must provide exactly what is needed, exactly when it is needed in the most straightforward and cost-effective manner possible. Your participation at the GANIS-2 Meteorology Session will help us cooperatively define future requirements. It will be an excellent opportunity to strengthen the dialogue between those who use weather information and those who supply it. The Meteorological Panel team will be there and we will be listening carefully to your views. I hope to see you there. everybody if we could get ourselves started again I hope now with a bit of coffee a bit of caffeine those of you that have had to travel long distances will be feeling a little bit more comfortable so our next session is about enabling safe operations through collaboration none of us can do any of the work on developing regulatory frameworks and such alone. It takes a lot of different perspectives, so we are going to be hearing from a lot of different perspectives in this session. And we'll have Mr. Mike Gadd as our moderator. Mike is a business and technical lead for the UAS and cyber programs in the United Kingdom at the CAA. 
He's also very well known to us here in ICAO. He serves as the chairman of the RPAS panel. So when Mike took over that role, he became my new best friend, whether he wanted to or not. He participates in and supports a number of regulation and requirement development forums, as well as working with us on the panel. So I will let Mike take over this session. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, and first of all, thank you for the invitation, and uh, certainly to address um, all you guys here uh, is, is quite an honor. I think you represent uh, pretty much every aspect of the industry that we have and is developing. What I would do first, I think, is uh, a couple of uh, topics, uh, and that is this is a discussion panel. This is a forum to engage with. We have some fantastic experts here who I'll come to in a moment. Um, but please think about what questions you might have, either for this session or for the following sessions in the coming days. This is your opportunity to uh, engage, question, and challenge the people that ha have um, volunteered to be up here. So this is the second ARPAS Symposium. Um, and last year, at the first symposium, um, ICAO presented the work of the ARPAS panel. Um, so this year, we have the opportunity to review where we've got to, and to take the knowledge from that last session and the work of the ARPAS panel over the year and build upon that. What I can say so far in terms of the ARPAS panel um, is that earlier in the year, we delivered the first set of draft SARP proposals um, for licensing. And there is a session discussing that very topic tomorrow. Our next objective is to deliver two more proposed sets of SARPs, uh, one on airworthiness and one on operations. And as we heard earlier this morning, those three topics create the pillar of being able to deal with remotely piloted aircraft systems. Those being quite distinct from the, the typical drone or unmanned aircraft or UAS that we see. Um, so I will draw the distinction in ARPAS from the ICAO terminology um, being a fully international capable certificated platform. So the purpose of this session is really to try and set the scene, to provide an overarching view of how we can enable safe operation, and particularly how we will have to work, cooperate, collaborate um, to ensure that all of the different aspects of safe operation can be covered, whether that is the vehicle, the airspace, the aerodromes, and the service provisions that support all of that. And particularly how we enable that to happen alongside what is the traditional or the manned aviation aspects. So, on to our guests, our panel. Um, I'll, what I'll do here is I'll just introduce them one by one, and they can therefore come, and come here uh, and give us their first thoughts, their views. And then once everyone has um, presented that, we will get into some questions. So you have time to think about them and post them on the email system that was notified earlier. So without further ado, um, I'll introduce our first panel member, which is Mr. Brian Wynn. Um, Brian is the president and CEO of AUVSI and represents more than 7,000 members from more than 60 countries involved in the fields of government, industry, and academia. Prior to joining AUVSI, uh, he was president and CEO of the Electric Drive Transportation Association. 
He's also a member of the Drone Advisory Committee with the FAA, uh, as Earl spoke about earlier. And with that, I'll ask Brian to take the stand. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Everybody awake out there? Okay, it's a little quiet in here, so we're trying to get the energy up for this fantastic panel. I'm delighted to be here. Mike, thank you very much. Leslie, I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and very, very distinguished panel. So looking forward to the discussion with all of them. I'm going to start with the why, because I think it's very important to kind of remind ourselves uh, that there are a lot of people that are relying on those of us that are in the room to get this done and get it done right. And several have alluded to the fact that, uh, and Mike left out the most important part of my bio, which is I'm a, I'm a commercial pilot working on my CFI and trying to garner the courage to teach other people how to fly. So um, I'm a manned aviator for 25 years uh, and have a deep respect for the tradition of aviation and the importance of airmanship uh, and professionalism in all things that fly. Uh, but I also wanted to point out that AUVSI represents not just uh, unmanned systems in the airspace. We uh, do, as we like to say, all things unmanned. So uh, automated vehicles are part of our remit, uh, ground robotics, things on, in the maritime domain, things that float, things that swim, et cetera, et cetera. And that's very important uh, because what we're going to be talking about uh, in this conversation and in future conversations is, is how do these automated and ultimately autonomous vehicles interact with one another, including those that are manned aircraft, like mine and some of those that you fly. And um, that will happen on the ground, it will happen in the air, uh, it will happen in the flight levels, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and we need to get all that right. And if I've learned anything from promoting technologies, which I've been doing uh, for 30 odd years in Washington and foreign capitals, the execution is important. It's critical. Uh, if you don't execute right, I think of General Motors diesel in the 1970s, a technology never takes off. 50% uh, of the cars sold in, in Europe now are, are diesels, uh, probably greater than 50%. Uh, that's a much lower level number in the United States of America. And I think GM has responsibility for that. They didn't execute that technology very well. Uh, and that was a lesson that I learned. And I don't mean to pick on GM. I drive a GM car, by the way, a Chevy Bolt. Uh, Bolt with a, with a B, which I think is the best car I've ever driven, frankly. Uh, but I wanted to make this point that we are not alone in the airspace. It turns out there are a lot more things to hit down here on the ground, and there are going to be aircraft that are moving around on our runways that are autonomous and that are automated or remotely piloted or uh, optionally piloted or use whatever nomenclature you want from this very nomenclature challenged community. And we can learn from the, the things that are going on in those domains as well. So that's one of the, I think, one of the key roles that AVSI can play. But back to my point about why, this is not just about, hey, this is a cool technology and we can use it in a lot of different ways. Look at what's going on over here. There are major industries, I'm pressed to think of one that isn't interested in utilizing this technology in some form or fashion, that are pulling this technology into the marketplace. And if I learned anything from trying to make the world safe for electric vehicles, you've got to have demand. There is huge demand for this technology. Uh, and, and, and it's not just the technology is outrunning the regulatory speed and the regulatory structure, it's that the technology is trying to keep up with the demand. A, a perfect example of this is wildland fires in the United States of America. We have 30 major fires burning in the West right now. Uh, there are probably 250 fires burning all, all together, but 30 major fires, and I forget exactly what metric is used uh, to, to actually designate that. Unmanned systems can stay aloft in all kind, 24 hours a day, in, 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 fly at night, fly in smoky environments, fly close to terrain, et cetera, et cetera, and provide immediate situational awareness to site commanders. My son's a firefighter. That's really important to people that are fighting fires. They can do so, and this is a, part, a Department of Interior statistic uh, from last week presented to Congress. They can do so uh, at, in a seventh of the time at a tenth of the cost to the United States taxpayer. 
and, and I'm just using the taxpayer as an example because that was uh, the statistics that was the statistic that was put before us. Now, a very interesting example and one that I chose for a reason because we've also had air operations for wildland fires grounded because somebody launched a drone. Right? That's bad execution. And so these are the kinds of things that we are uh, right smack in the middle of in this community today. In terms of a large aircraft, uh, I think that we have learned how to fly aircraft in the, in the flight levels for quite some time. It's been done by the military. It's been done safely. Manned and unmanned aircraft have been well integrated in military operations. And I'm absolutely convinced with the brain power in this room and in our community generally uh, that we will be able to do it uh, for commercial operations as well. So with that, I look forward to that. My watchword also, uh, as Earl pointed out, and as this panel is entitled, is indeed collaboration. And I feel very privileged to be here and to represent an extremely, an extremely robust value chain of technology solution providers that are bringing uh, innovation to this discussion. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Brian. So you can start thinking about your questions. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Gilberto Lopez Mayer, who is the Senior Vice President for Safety and Flight Operations at the International Air Transport Association. Prior to this position, uh, he had various uh, roles within the Mexican federal government agencies, including as Director General. Um, he was appointed as chairman of the ICAO's Group of International Aviation and Climate Change in 2009 and the ICAO High Level Safety Conference in 2015. Captain Lopez holds uh, uh, a degree uh, uh, from the University of the National Autonomy de Mexico. Apologies for my pronunciation here. Uh, and as a valid airline transport pilot license. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome him to the stand, please. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Firstly, <clears throat> I'd like to thank the International Civil Aviation Organization uh, for the invitation to speak at this very prestigious event. I'm very honored to be here. The introduction of ARPAS brings new stakeholders and operators to aviation, many of which are here today. Some of you may not be familiar with the International Air Transport Association, so I'd like to show you a few slides about our organization. IATA has 265 airline members worldwide, and this is uh, approximately 80% of uh, total commercial air traffic in the world. We have uh, 1,400 staff members in 54 offices in 53 countries. And we handle around 380 billion US dollars per year in our financial systems, primarily focused on billing and settlement. So I think it is fair to say that uh, we are not a typical association. Within IATA, we have five divisions, and I'm in charge of the Safety and Flight Operations Division. As the name suggests, we cover all operational areas related to airline operation. And we have Safety and Flight Operations staff worldwide located in the major hubs of aviation operations. Our headquarters are here in Montreal, right across the street. And we are here for one very specific reason. We are here to collaborate with and to support ICAO in their work. And safety stands at the top of our agenda. We have a six-point safety strategy. The six components of this strategy are to reduce operational risk, to ensure quality and compliance, to advocate 
for improved aviation infrastructure, to support consistent implementation of SMS, to support effective recruitment and training, and to identify and address emerging safety issues. And it is not surprising at all that all of these areas are totally applicable to a non-operations as well. And considering the projected growth of ARPA's operations, it is very important that we work together closely as an industry in all of these items. The growth and the scope of future UAS ARPA's operations is really exceptional from a small to large aircraft, from low to high altitude, from using very basic to very advanced technology. UAS and ARPA's operations really brings new thinking, new technology, and new investment to the aviation industry. And this brings also new opportunities, new advancements, but also new challenges, especially from an international perspective. And uh, as I have already mentioned, safety is IATA's priority, and it must be industry's top priority to enable the safe introduction and evolution of ARPA's operation. Air traffic management will play a key role and may have to change to accommodate new and main operations, as it will be a cornerstone to ensure that men and unmanned aircraft operate in a manner that does not negatively impact safety. In fact, the opposite may be true, as advancement in technology and new concept of operations may mean that we can actually rise the safety bar even higher. This is the real opportunity we have. Licensing and training is a critical component of any aviation operation. And the introduction of a non-aircraft in busy airspace brings new challenges ranging from human factors to ensuring appropriate knowledge and skills for new entrants. Harmonization of uh, regulations is also critical. One of the main burdens we face today in, in man aviation is unharmonized technology and certification requirements leading to unnecessary cost and regulatory complexities for limited operational benefit. The ICAO ARPAS panel is playing a critical role in developing IFR standards for international ARPAS operations. IATA is fully integrated into the different working groups and was a key contributor to developing the first concept of operations. We fully support the ICAO work and we will remain an integral part of it. That says, as ARPA's operations evolve, we see a need to ensure the ICAO processes are able to keep pace with advancements in technology. This may mean a different way of working for ICAO and regulators to allow us to enter uncharted territory safely and positively. In fact, we foresee new IATA members in the future being ARPAS operators, especially in the cargo area. This is how important this is for us. So we are at an exciting time of innovation, and I look forward to learning more about ARPA's operation this week and to how we can jointly work on optimizing its contribution to aviation of, as a, for a society as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gilberto. Um, I would now like to introduce our next panel member, which is Mr. Jeff Poole. Uh, and the first thing I would note is an apology that his title within the program is incorrect. 
So uh, if you do wish to make the change, he is the Director General of the Civil Air Navigation Services Organization, so CANSO. Um, Jeff was appointed in December 2012 to this role, and in addition to leading and managing CANSO, he represents its members as the global voice of air traffic management. He is responsible for delivering the CANSO strategic plan for air traffic management, Vision 2020, uh, further expanding CANSO's worldwide membership and strengthening CANSO's relationship with ICAO, industry associations and other stakeholders. So with that, Jeff, would you please come talk to us? Thank you and uh, good morning everybody. Um, the title of this session, uh, Collaboration to Enable Safe Operations, really does sum up the, uh, the CANSO approach. Um, safety, as Gilberto has men mentioned, is always our number one uh, priority. And in CANSO's case, that means focusing on the safe separation of aircraft. Now, collaboration is a key part of partnership and is one of the three pillars of CANSO's strategic plan, uh, Vision 2020. And safety and collaboration, in our view, go hand in hand to ensure safe and efficient operations. So CANSO's role is to act as the global voice of air traffic management on key issues, and that very much includes RPAS. So that's why I'm here today, uh, and you will also be hearing uh, later this week from each of the co-chairs of the CANSO RPAS and Emerging Technologies Workgroup. And it's also why we have CANSO representatives here on the various ICAO uh, committees, but also in Europe and elsewhere on the groups that are tackling the difficult issue of how to integrate RPAS safely into airspace. The first thing I'd like to do is, is, is try to set a little bit of an ATM uh, context here. The last 10 years have seen a huge growth in non-traditional entrance to airspace, such as commercial space vehicles, uh, balloons, including those operated by CANSO member Google Loon to provide internet access, high altitude solar powered aircraft operated by another CANSO member, Facebook, also to provide internet access, and of course, the many remotely piloted aircraft systems. But our approach is the same for all who want to use airspace. That means understanding the business and the requirements of each user, collaborating to ensure everyone can safely use airspace without impacting unduly on other users, and working with regulators and other stakeholders to make this happen efficiently. So we welcome RPAS users, manufacturers, and UTM providers, and we are collaborating with them. But for air traffic management, there are three key questions. How do we continue to ensure safety? How do we make airspace accessible for all? And how does legacy air traffic management work alongside or and or integrate with a new UTM? Importantly, those of us in air traffic management must not be a barrier to progress or be seen to be a barrier, but we must balance this against genuine safety requirements. And when we talk about safety, I think we're all aware that recreational drones are becoming one of the biggest hazards to manned aviation. And if we are to ensure safety, we first need to understand the scale and the scope of the unmanned industry and be able to deal with the different aspects in the appropriate ways. Now, as as has already been mentioned, there are many different types of uh, unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles, from very low-level recreational drones to military and commercial RPAS, and even up to the very high levels of near-space RPAS. The challenge is that they are all very different to traditional airspace users. They have different performance characteristics, climb rates, maneuverability, and speed. And whilst an aircraft takes years to be designed, developed, tested, certified, and go into service, um, and then in service for 30 years or more, drones can take weeks. In the airspace, different separation standards are needed. And clearly, three nautical miles separation is not appropriate for a drone the size of a desk. And of course, 
uh, RPAS operators and others do not necessarily have the training or safety mindset of traditional p pilots. And that is something that we all need to address. Now, it's quite obvious that UTM operators and ATM operators need to work together. But in our view, that could either be integrated or separated, and both apply. So RPAS uh, flying in uh, airspace must comply with the current equipage requirements for the airspace they will operate in, regardless of size or user. But we need to separate in the vicinity of airports to prevent unauthorized use in the airspace. And many states are already introducing uh, no drone zones around sensitive areas, uh, including airports. But perhaps one thing we might need to consider uh, is to develop some new classes of airspace uh, to manage this whole issue more effectively. So briefly, what's the difference between ATM and UTM? The objectives are fundamentally the same of keeping airborne vehicles safe on their journeys. But there are differences. Today, air traffic management is very people-oriented and requires significant infrastructure to operate effectively. UTM, of course, is much more automated and less people-oriented. So information is key, and data sharing through the system-wide information management is essential to success. Uh, companies are already offering UTM services, and it's likely a competitive market uh, will develop in many of the uh, software applications, manufacturing side, and operating services. So, in our view, UTM cannot and should not be uh, developed in isolation from air traffic management. But we do need to ensure that there is a, a correct and appropriate regulatory framework that's clear to everybody. And we, the industry, need to help regulators uh, to have the right capabilities and experts to make this happen and to take the correct decisions for us all. Now, we would like to see globally harmonized regulations to ensure that all states adopt the same standards and give certainty and simplicity for operators worldwide. But regulators need to facilitate the overall performance of ATM and UTM to flourish safely. And that means taking a risk-based performance-based uh, approach uh, and not over-regulating. So we urge regulators and support regulators and states to innovate, move fast, and work with the industry rather than being the gatekeeper of yesterday's problem and yesterday's operations. And specifically, that means we believe that registration should be compulsory for every uh, uh, UAS or RPAS. Uh, there should be certification and training for users, and there should be public awareness campaigns for users. So very briefly to finish, what is Canso itself doing? Well, our uh, RPAS uh, working group covers both low-level operations and those above uh, flight level 600. We're publishing guidance for air navigation service providers with particular focus on training. We're producing operational guidance materials, including operational approvals, uh, checklists, and best practices. Um, and we're also uh, exploring the, uh, the management of uh, traditionally uncontrolled airspace in the upper altitude uh, strata. And in Europe, we're supporting strongly the development of a regulatory framework, uh, working closely with EASA. Uh, we co contribute to the work of JARUS, and we participate in the ECO RPAS panel to develop the uh, harmonized SARPs and PANs and t technical uh, work on lost link issues. And we co-chair the ICAO UAS Advisory Group, which has produced uh, web material on state regulations, educational flyers, toolkits for pilots, etc., um, and which has been tasked to develop the global framework for ATM. So in conclusion, I'll finish where I started. We must all collaborate to ensure safe operations. The ATM and UTM communities can benefit vastly uh, from each other and, importantly, learn from each other. But collaboration must not slow things down in this fast-developing area. And the secrets of effective collaboration are understanding each other, being flexible, and recognizing that we all have to do things differently. So the stakes are high. We must get this right if we are to keep aviation as the safest form of transport. Thank you.
Thank you, Jeff. Uh, moving on to our next panelist, um, this is Mr. David Gamper, uh, who is Director, Safety, Technical and Legal Affairs at the Airport Council International's World Office here in Montreal. He's responsible for policy and best practice guidance on aerodrome safety. Excuse me. shows how, good, how well our timekeeping is going so far. Um, sorry, back to David. Um, so he's um, responsible for policy and best practice guidance on aerodrome safety, operations and efficiency, as well as ATM issues, and for the coordination with the ACI regions on these matters. Um, he has been an observer on ICAO's Air Navigation Commission since 2011 and a member of the ICAO Aerodrome Design and Operations Panel since its inception. He takes part in other ICAO panels as required and holds a degree in engineering science from the University of Cambridge in the UK. So, David, welcome to the stand. Thank you for that introduction, Mike, and uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you to ICAO for inviting ACI to share its views, and uh, that is an honor for ACI. Um, for those not familiar with ACI, we, we are uh, the International Association of, of Airport Operators, and we regard ourselves as the voice of airports. So. Um, we're a not-for-profit organization whose prime purpose is to foster cooperation between members of ACI and other partners in aviation, including states, ICAO, IATA, CANSO, ICC, AIA, uh, IFALPA, and other international organizations. Um, we have 623 members uh, currently representing, uh, sorry, operating 1,940 airports in 176 countries around the world. So as uh, Dr. Alu said at, at the beginning, the main purpose of ICAO work is to create regulations in this field for international RPAS operations. And uh, we are uh, firmly behind that and supporting ICAO. Um, from the point of view of uh, aer aerodrome operators, civil RPAS that need a runway will need to fit into airport traffic on runways, taxiways, and aprons, and operate also in unsegregated airspace in the future. Will airports be faced with significant RPAS traffic in future? No one really knows for sure, but widespread use may be only a matter of time. At that time, the question will be how to fit RPAS traffic seamlessly into the run of, run of traffic. And I must say that uh, delays at airports are anathema, of course, to the airport operator as well as to the users. But um, on the other hand, infrastructure of airports is in short supply generally. It is costly and it is difficult to increase uh, the supply of infrastructure. So close cooper uh, cooperation and collaboration, as the, the title of this session uh, talks about, between RPAS operators, airlines, manufacturers, air traffic management, airports, and more will be required. We're only beginning to understand how we might integrate such operations into the normal run of traffic. For airport operators, that is a key issue because a busy airport cannot stop its normal flight operations to allow a different type of operation to take place. What we need is seamless integration. And we need also to maintain at the same time the safety level uh, on runways and taxiway systems. Maintaining the, the progress that has been made on runway safety in the last uh, years. And in this field with, of RPAS, we're working very closely with ICAO's RPAS panel, helping to draft new regulations. And in particular, recently, the new part of Annex 6, which relates to RPAS operations. And there are certain key elements in that for us, which I'll come back to. The ICAO RPAS manual, which was already produced a few years ago, uh, uses the term operations from established aerodromes. And although RPAS can operate from other places than 
established aerodromes, if they do operate from aerodromes, the chapter 15 of the RPAS manual uh, on use of aerodromes says that states need to evaluate the applicability of Annex 14 specifications to RPAS operations. And we agree with this section which talks about integration issues on the airfield, such as that the RPAS must be able to detect markings and signs. It has to be able to operate in the airfield environment and follow visual aids on the movement area. Uh, also observe ATC instructions, uh, observe instructions from apron management service, um, be able to integrate into ground operations generally, and to be able to operate on taxi routes. So all this needs more work, I think, and uh, we are only at the beginning of that work. However, I'd like to sort of take a higher level view, which is that civil aviation is the safest form of transportation, as we all know, and it's an engine of uh, local and global economies, and collaboration is what actually got us to that level of success. Likewise, I believe collaboration will drive us forward, and this symposium is an excellent step in this direction. We are very interested in making airports work safely, securely, and efficiently. And that is a dance where everyone plays a part in the choreography. It may be not be simple to integrate RPAS, whose operator is not necessarily on the airfield, but that has to be our goal. And the advent of RPAS operations will even further increase the need for airport collaborative decision making, or ACDM for short for which worldwide guidance has been published by ICAO, uh, along with ACI, CANSO, and, and IATA. I do believe that these uh, collaboration activities that are going on at the moment will be broadened to encompass RPAS. And um, those systems that are, are presently being developed on the airfield for more automated navigation, for example, on the, on the airfield for manned aviation, uh, will also be suitable uh, to be expanded and, and used by RPAS. Uh, so this is, is where we uh, come to things like uh, ASMGCS and uh, further developments of that. So lastly, I wanted to just mention, although I, because I can't really avoid it, I think, the subject of small drones. So small drones are a huge market with many uses, and those are opening up, and it's becoming evident that this will be a very significant activity economically. They can also be, I'd like to mention this because it hasn't been mentioned so far, useful to airports and airport operators. And there are tests and trials going on uh, involving uh, inspections, for example, even lighting inspections, uh, surveillance, uh, wildlife, management and there are many possible applications and we would like also as, as ACI to foster that kind of experimentation to make sure that it could actually play a useful role in future. But the second, the bad side of small drones is the risk to civil aviation, the risk to uh, of one of these small aircraft or small RPAS or small drones flying into the flight path of an, air, an airliner. So we are very happy that IKEA has introduced its website, the UAS Toolkit. We think that more is required, um, including harmonized guidance. It's just been mentioned again. And uh, I do believe uh, this is, is something that we can all work on together. Uh, we as ACI have published an advisory bulletin last year, um, stressing the importance of bringing risk situations to the attention of regulators, local government, and law enforcement, and also working with your air navigation service provider as an airport, and encouraging the CAAs to create no drone zones around airports, uh, to introduce uh, regulation registration of drones, and uh, also safe drone operating practices, um, public knowledge of where drones may or may not be operated. So, in conclusion, uh, I think that the, this whole field is just opening up enormously at the moment. We as airport operators want to be part of it, and we believe that collaboration is strongly the way forward. Thank you.
Thank you, David. And, and now on to our uh, final uh, panel member, um, and that is Mr. Yan Pai, uh, who is Chairman of the International Coordinating Council of Aerospace Industries Associations. And he is also the Secretary General of the Aerospace and Defence Industries Association of Europe. Um, so I'd like to welcome him to the stand where he is to talk on behalf of the global manufacturers of aeronautical and space technologies. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate to be here and, and, um, and be speaking in my capacity of chairman for the ICC AIA. So uh, first of all, just one word about ACCIA. As said already, this is the manufacturing industry representing one region in the world, if I may, and five different countries. So it's the European uh, under the umbrella of ASD and where I'm also the secretary general. And then it's the US industry, it's the Canadian industry, it's the Russian, the Bra uh, Brazilian industry. And did I mention the Canadian? So it should be six. I don't know if I, if I lost someone there. Um, as you know, the manufacturing industry is represented at ICC AIA. We have a collective goal, and this collective goal is, of, of course, what we do towards a KO. Uh, this is about our contribution to maximize the manufacturing industry's uh, efforts to a safe, secure, and efficient international air transportation system. And we're happy to say that we have an observer status where we are actually actively participating in the world of a, uh, work of ICAO in many different working groups, and we have uh, roughly around 100 experts uh, or more from industry uh, related to these different working groups. I uh, can't say, though, when I compare the slides that I've seen here uh, with 1,400 in staff, I am a little bit uh, jealous about you or envy your situation a bit. We have two half-time representatives here in Montreal, but they are performing well, so rest assured that manufacturing industry is heard anyway. Um, coming back to, to drones, of course, which this is all about, I think the fact that drones activities are being developed without a clear regulatory framework in itself is sort of a sign of a future booming market. There is uh, so much enthusiasm behind what drones can do for the future. And for most applications to fly outside uh, segregated airspace, this is a precondition to operate. And this is clear. Um, if one would allowed to think a little bit visionary, look into the crystal ball and think about the future, what are we looking at? Well, there could be a, a situation where the majority of aircrafts uh, actually are offered with a single pilot cockpit in the future, where business jets uh, actually operate without a pilot, where the global freight network is operating without a pilot, where you see regional freight networks expanding into areas that are more sparsely populated uh, than ever before because there is an economic benefit or upside with operating without a pilot. So all of this would be possible. I don't know which year to think about, but just to exemplify and, and have sort of a brainstorming in 2100, for example, you could still find pilots on board single uh, pilot cockpits on board aircrafts, um, this is for sure, maybe it's a, it's a single pilot. Maybe you would find in some cases as well twin uh, pilot cockpits in aircrafts. Um, but the thing is, how would that be perceived from the public audience in the future? Would it be seen like when you have uh, a pilot or a twin pilot in an aircraft, would that be related in 2100 to the fact that actually the aircraft is a little bit of an old design and an old production and so on? Would it be seen by the public as this is a safer uh, aircraft because of the pilots or would it be seen as this is not as safe as the modern technologies because there's a risk of human errors and so on? And from all of those different kind of perspectives, this is not just a technology driver, this is also a development, this is also related very much to what would be the public perception, which areas would we be allowed into entering uh, with, with these new kind of technologies. And I think from that perspective, a little bit outside of the speech, but just a reflection on what has been said, I think it's already interesting to see that the entrance to the market that we see now for drones is actually going into many new areas where drones can do the job that had been very difficult to do uh, before. So yes, there's a number of new market activities that where drones could be used. But let's not forget the fact 
that unmanned uh, aircrafts could actually do all the job that is being done today as well. The big volume job could be done in the future without pilots. At least from a technological perspective, this would be a reality. Now, I know this is looking a lot forward, and uh, I'd be happy to take any, any debates on that. And again, public perception, we don't know what would be the end of that. But if you think about what it looked like in the 70s, we had a captain on board, we had a first officer on board, we had a radio operator on board, we had a navigator on board, we have an, a, a mechanic on board in the cockpit. And I see nobody complaining because that has been squeezed now. So technology is really developing and changing the way we see as well what are the safe operations. From this perspective, um, it's very clear that ICAO has a clear responsibility to address the regulatory part of these issues. If this is being done, engineers and business people will take care of the rest. This is, this is for sure. And of course, new rules and regulations won't be um, found in one day or, or even in one year. But I think it's very important that we have a collective, clear mind about the intentions, the directions, who is doing what, and what are the directions to be taken, so that there is no doubt about that. This is so important for businesses, because business won't be able to invest in new technologies and develop them for a market entrance without having the regulation in place that's so that we would understand what are the business preconditions when we, when we do our investments. ACAO needs from that perspective to provide the framework in order for the world, basically the global society, to take the full benefits of what drones can offer in the future. And keeping schedule is of paramount importance in that perspective. And this includes the working, uh, I mean, in terms of a balanced pace, which is one thing, time frames, and also ensuring the balance between the de developments for use space for certified drones and also for high level operations. So, I mean, the whole broad spectra at the same time should be under the umbrella. Uh, to exemplify, if there would be separation standards to be applied to UTM, which we heard about here in a very low uh, level concept, then ICAO must be the principal stakeholder to agree on these standards, because otherwise we risk again that there would be different standards in different regions of the world. Mm. And we would lose uh, time to market, we would uh, see uh, administrative burdens, we would lose efficiency, we would lose money, and this would just be bad for, for the sector as a whole. So coordination is key, it's essential uh, not to generate double work, and ICAO has the leadership. This is the only one that we can see uh, to lead this role or, or this um, process. But of course it includes also the close cooperation with JARUS. Uh, let's not waste or forget or, or use the efforts that has already been done within JARUS when doing so. So a close cooperation there would be, would be uh, wanted from our side. And of course, it's impossible to address AirPass without saying a word on cyber. Uh, for sure, this is a new technology uh, that we are looking at ahead uh, to, to, uh, to see being fully employed and fully engaged. Uh, and if there would be any mistakes on the cyber uh, security side, of course, this could uh, create a severe damage to the whole development of the sector at a very early phase. So cyber security is key. And from that perspective, we are also very happy to see the AKO efforts on cyber security. I think I could sum up basically what I'm trying to say in, I had five minutes, I don't know whether I kept it within the five minutes, but I could have summed it up in five words as well. I could say no regulatory framework, no business. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Now, we have just a few minutes before we keep you from lunch, um, but I also have quite a considerable number of questions that have been posted to us, so thank you for that. Um, what that means is, um, rather than not cut into your lunch too much, um, I will apologize to those whose questions we don't raise here to the panel, um, but maybe you can talk to them directly um, if you can pin them down over lunch. Um, so I think we have time for perhaps two or three of the questions I have here. Um, but I'm going to take the liberty of first come, first served, and ask my question first. <laughs> um, and, and that is quite a simple question, but maybe a complex answer. Um, so to each of the, the panel members that would wish to respond, maybe if you grab a microphone, um, I would ask, 
Um, what do you see from your area, your sector, what do you see as the most pressing challenge, the most urgent need um, in terms of the topic of collaborating to enable safe operations? Who would like to go first, or shall I nominate? Or a phrase I was told a couple of days ago is, you're now, you, you're now being voluntold rather than volunteered. Uh, very simply, uh, and, and I'm being very tactical here in my answer, Mike, it's, it's remote identification. Uh, right now we have a lot of people flying anonymously, and we wouldn't tolerate that in manned operations. And, uh, and so uh, being able to remotely identify uh, is extremely important for those that need to enforce the rules. Uh, and somebody mentioned no drone zones earlier. I confess I'm not a big fan of no drone zones because we've already had some authorized drone operations uh, confuse our law enforcement people, for example, uh, because uh, they were in a no drone zone. Right? So I'm a big fan of authorized drone only zones, uh, much like we see on a highway where it says authorized vehicles only can do a U-turn here, um, but you have to be able to identify that drone. I'm talking about smalls. I, I think when we get into larger, the, the tweeners and larger aircraft, I think that, you know, the equipage will be very different. Uh, but to me, that's key in the regulatory framework that we're trying to move forward with, with flight over people, uh, and ultimately beyond visual line of sight, we have to be able to identify operations, uh, make sure they're authorized. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm not going to go on the technical side to answer this. Uh, what is our biggest challenge? Uh, from from our perspective, with I mean having having accidents uh, accidents uh, do not happen very often now. They are so rare, fortunately, and this is uh, part of the big success that we have in aviation because safety is somehow take it, taken for granted. You know, we all believe in safety. No, very few people are really concerned about safety when they are traveling on an aircraft right now. And and and, and I have a dream. And my dream is that uh, we will take a step back because soon we will see millions of drones flying. We are now having thousands, but very soon we will have millions of them. And drones, I mean UAS, ARPAS, are a big opportunity for our society. But, uh, but we, can, we could take a step back. And my dream is that we won't either because of risk, increased risk, or, or because what Jan said about perception of risk. And, and that can be, those two can be equally dangerous, I must say. So this is my answer. Thank you. Thank you. And my dream. OK. A nice dream. It's always a pleasure to sit next to Martin Luther King. <laughs> <laughs> um, from, 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 the, from my point of view of air traffic management, I think the biggest challenge we have is to inject a sense of urgency into, into a lot of this stuff. We keep talking, we, we all recognize the challenges that we have, but the challenges are going to get bigger with time, and we're also beginning to lose control on a number of the things where we, where we genuinely need to be in control. So, you know, I would like to see us all have more sense of urgency here. Here, and that means ICAO stepping up to what we're all saying about creating the, uh, the regulatory framework for ATM. And it's incumbent upon us to support ICAO and allow them to focus on, on the key issues, as far as I'm concerned. I think that's a, that's a real challenge. Okay. Thank you. David? I think our cha challenge in airports is maintaining runway safety with large pass operations. And that's um, absolutely got to be uh, bottom line. That is uh, it's done. Um, and on the small drones, well, I think uh, it's been said before that there's, there are safety risks. It is a challenge to keep them away from uh, from airliners. We need to find better ways of doing that. Uh, whether it's no drone zones or not, it might not be. Might be uh, other means of, of doing that, but it really is a challenge. I think. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to pick up where Jeff, uh, on what Jeff said as well. I think this is very important uh, from uh, the manufacturing perspective. I think the harmonization of uh, certification and regulatory processes would really be key. And there's a risk here that you can see a number of initiatives going on on the national level, on European level, on US level. Uh, and this has practically started because of the bottom-up push. There is technology and people start to use that technology not just in hobby purposes, it's also in business purposes already. So not waiting for the regulator if the regulator is too slow. Mm -hmm. Now, if this process can go on too long, we're just in, in sort of a, a very difficult situation to, to get a, a KO, to get the, the, the grab of the whole situation, so to say, and to guide the processes. So uh, the common to ramp up a KO and, and to take the leadership and, and the common um, uh, framework to be set by a KO, I think this is, this is crucial for us. All right. Thank you, guys. Now, just to make sure we do cover off a couple of questions from the floor. Um, so uh, the first one I have here that I've selected, so if your question isn't asked, you can blame me. Um, we spoke earlier about um, separation criteria and that they may need to be different for drones. Um, who would like to offer their thoughts on the rationale, the why, and what they think that should start to consider? Um, I'm not going to answer the question, but I'll just make, make a comment, which is I think I'm not sure that anybody right now knows the exact answer to that question. There isn't, a, there isn't a, today a right answer, but it's absolutely one of the critical aspects that we need to be reviewing and, and reviewing quite, quite quickly. Um, it's going, it, it, you know, the separation standards uh, in, in our space will be a, a, a critical part of the, the regulatory framework that, that determines success and determines safety. But we can't, you know, again, we, we don't want to go over the top either. So we have to be uh, reasonable and allow uh, RPAS operations uh, to, to run, e run effectively. Okay. Well, just say that we're not starting from scratch. I, you know, I think the biggest challenge, of course, with, with separation is that, you know, it, when it's all said and done uh, in aviation, we've always got to see and avoid on, unless you're IMC. So that, that doesn't apply, obviously, for remote for our pass or UAS, um, and, and, but there is work that's being done, and I think it's quite robust work. On if if I can't see it, I need to miss it. If I need to miss it, I need. Well, how much do I need to miss it by, et cetera, et cetera. Once we have those in agreement, and I think industry goes to work and helps to design those solutions. And, and again, we're not starting from scratch. We have uh, we have some experience with that on the military side. So, thank you. So I'll now just choose the last question so that you can get to lunch. Um, and, and that is um, one thing I'll, I'll just say to the floor. There's a lot of questions we've received here that are much more focused about the UTM aspects. And so I would just ask that maybe that is something to save and repeat at the Drone Enable conference in a few days. Um, but so final question. Um, uh, and, and that is, um, we talked about convergence of UTM and ATM systems. So the question is, um, do we see the need that the, the standards that we develop ATM systems against should apply for those systems that are dealing in uh, an RPAS or a drone space? I think the answer to that is don't think about ATM and UTM, think about performance requirements. And in particular, when, when we've got uh, RPAS operating in regulated airspace, they're, they're going to have to uh, follow, follow the, the same performance requirements, however that's achieved. Um, and I think that the trick here will be that UTM and, and ATM can learn from each other. The technologies developed uh, and the processes and lessons learned in one sector can, up, can apply across uh, to the other. So again, making the point, we're not starting from scratch here. We've already got a basis there. But focus on performance requirements when looking at, at regulatory issues and technologies. Okay. Any final comments from the other members? Jan. 
Uh, I'll just uh, briefly to, to mention that at the beginning, yes, but, but in the future, I'll, I'll think that UTM will provide a great opportunity to develop even new business models for any navigation service provider, for example. Yeah. It will completely change the layout of the, of the industry and this sector. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to, to uh, complement as well what already been said about uh, standards. I think that uh, using prescriptive standards in a way is uh, telling industry how to do the job. Uh, and then everybody realizes that technology is developing much faster than the regulatory framework. And then you're already sort of behind the train. So the thing here is really for IKEO to take another approach uh, strategically as much as ever possible to go for performance-based standards and allow technology development actually to be fully employed and be part of the solution for the future rather than a problem. Uh, this, this should be the approach. I, I may just add, I think that uh, large RPAS should really behave in the same kind of way as, as uh, tra traditional, if I may say, aircraft. And we should not expect that their performance would be worse. If anything, it might be better. And so performance-based standards might create an opportunity to uh, create a more efficient uh, system. <coughs> Okay, then thank you one and all for your uh, information, your, your talk, and also for, for the depth of the responses to the questions. So can I ask everyone just to show their thanks to these guys? And now I can step down and just hand over to Leslie for a moment. Yes, thank you. It was an excellent session. And thank you, Mike, for moderating. Now, it is almost lunchtime, but not quite. So I'm going to keep everybody right where you are for a few more minutes and share a couple last items and then invite up a couple other speakers. So we will be putting the presentations up online on the symposium website. The ones presented today will go up later today. The ones tomorrow will go up late tomorrow. So if any speakers have a problem with presentations going online, let us know in advance, because they, they will otherwise go up. And I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our lunch sponsors today, our gold sponsors. We have Mr. Jonathan Weaver, for the Aviation Business Development at Esri. I know a lot of you have already been to their booth just outside the door here. Along with Mr. John Damish, Chief Growth Officer for in situ, which is one of the Boeing companies. So gentlemen, please, we have a short presentation and then we'll go to lunch. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I suppose it's uh, afternoon now that we're bleeding into the lunch hour. Um, and even perhaps for some of you that have traveled a great distance, uh, good evening. So uh, we do recognize that we are keeping you from your lunch. So we will try to expedite things and, and make sure things are moving forward here. Um, the title of the presentation is, is Leveraging GIS to enable safe integration of drones into the national airspace. And really what we're going to do is we're going to divide this up into two parts. The first is kind of setting the context of what GIS is as a technology. And then I'm going to pass it over to John, who's going to talk about the application of GIS in terms of leveraging that uh, to enable that safe integration of drones into the airspace and using a very specific example in a case study. But first, if we talk about what GIS is as a platform, I think uh, many of you probably view GIS as a desktop type application where a GIS technician is in some office creating points, lines, and polygons to enable some of the map making. Now that certainly is one of the many parts of GIS, but it's not the only part. Uh, what they're doing is really creating a foundation, what we would call a system of record. Uh, but it's what we do with that system of record that enables 
the organization to really make powerful decisions. So kind of extending that to a system of engagement where users across an organization at all different levels within that organization from executives down to the operations level are able to take that information and create meaning and understanding of that geospatial data and technology uh, to create what we call a system of insight. And that's being able to understand the relationships of that information and, and data. Now, GIS as a technology is advancing. As I mentioned before, it used to be a desktop type application creating points, lines, and polygons, but we've moved beyond that. Uh, in the desktop realm, you could think of it as creating aeronautical charts, terminal procedure charts, things like that, in a very isolated environment. And then through the years, we added server technology that allowed us to connect to database systems and create this concept or this notion of of data-driven charting. And now what we've seen in the last five to 10 years is what we're now calling web GIS. Uh, being able to leverage geographic information across the organization, enable uh, discovery and access to that content, the authoritative content coming out of that organization. But now what we're really seeing is this move to what we call distributed GIS. And it really integrates all these other patterns together and then connects everything else and creates what we call the system of systems. So you have different nodes of GIS connecting to other systems to enable uh, decision making. And really what that lends itself towards is real time information management. So over the years, the decades, we've collected vast amount of, of data and information. You could almost look at it as um, Earth's digital twin. We've got uh, airport infrastructure that we've collected, uh, essentially cities that we've collected and have in this digital landscape. But now what we want to do is be able to add real-time information into that, weather, uh, live flights and, and flight tracks and IoT. So everything is now connected through sensors. And now, even within that real time, we're taking high velocity streams of data. At one point, we thought taking thousands or ten thousands, uh, tens of thousands of observation points was very impressive. But that's not enough anymore. Now we're taking and collecting hundreds of thousands or even millions of data points and observation points. But as we pull that information in, how can we distill that down to make meaningful information products to enable rapid decision making in real time? to create and support things like situational awareness, analytics, monitoring, and alerting. And so with that as a context, I'm going to pass it over to John, who's going to really take this GIS as a, as a technology and how they've applied that for some uh, d disaster and emergency response uh, applications. John. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, thank you very much for the invite to speak here today. This is uh, in situ's first time at IKO in addressing uh, this body of people, but uh, we are certainly not new to aviation. Um, for those that don't know, we are a wholly owned subsidiary of the Boeing Company, have been since the year 2008, and we have more than one million unmanned operational flight hours. So we have been doing this for quite a long time. We've learned a lot of lessons along the way, and now we are trying to bring those lessons learned and add value to the commercial context for UAS application. So what I'm going to share with you today is, is a bit of our thinking of, you know, why do we fly? Um, Aviation's a time machine is one of the things that we say inside the company. It gets goods and people from A to B faster, but it also gets sensors on target faster and more efficiently than any other means. Um, to do this properly, you need a good GIS backbound. You need a common frame of reference, that is the Earth's reference system, and GIS provides that path to get that in to support the workflow that we tend to refer to as PCAD, planning, collection, analysis, and distribution. It starts with planning, certainly through airspace data, but when you look into the UAS community, uh, we tend to operate a slightly larger UAS, a Group 2 UAS, roughly around 50 pounds of gross takeoff weight. We tend to operate in the same flight envelope as a Piper Cub might. That said, we integrate and utilize a variety of smaller UAS systems which operate much closer to the ground, sub 500 feet above ground level. At that altitude, low altitude obstruction data is critical and something that tends to be uh, somewhat missing from your standard aviation charts. So there's a new demand set 
created by the operation of small UAS, and that is a priori knowledge for the airmen of where these low altitude obstructions are. All of a sudden, a power line is not something you can just fly 100 feet above because you're trying to inspect it. So how do I get accurate geospatial information to the operator such that they know exactly where that is for planning purposes? Extending beyond planning, um, when deploying the sensors, now we have to do the CAD part, the collect, analyze, and distribute. Um, Almost all of our commercial customers use some sort of GIS, and most of them use Esri systems to share their infrastructure information with us. Their geospatial distribution of their infrastructure is in their GIS systems, is available usually as shapefiles, and we integrate directly with those systems so that we can plan our flights accordingly and maximize the efficiency of the aerial asset. So I'm going to skip through this slide pretty quickly. I mean, notionally, these are the players in, in, the, uh, in the environment. Um, and I'm going to go right to the next one and talk about the use case. That way you can go eat. Um, over the last few weeks, our uh, activity level has been extraordinary. Um, we have supported uh, hurricane and disaster relief efforts for Hurricane Harvey and Irma, uh, and we are currently still actively supporting the Eagle Creek fire. Um, as Brian mentioned, you know, the West is burning in the United States. Um, Eagle Creek Flyer, uh, Fire, for, for those of you that are unfamiliar with in situ, our headquarters is, is literally within 20 miles of the uh, flashpoint of that fire. So we have a very vested interest in, in helping out the incident commanders and the emergency responders for that fire because that's our home. Um, we deployed our systems uh, within a day and were up and operational over the fire. And perhaps the most important part, and this really uh, hints to the value of UAS, is that we were flying at night. And we were flying at night when no other fire assets were flying. That's critical because uh, with incident command and, and fire response, um, prior to the use of UAS in this construct, the only time the fire could be surveilled from the air was during the day which meant that overnight the fire was left alone to do whatever it wanted to do and incident commander would not get sight of what happened overnight until daybreak when they could launch manned aircraft and surveil the fire line. Even that was fraught with challenge because the fire line is obscured obviously by smoke. So the ability for a UAS to carry uh, an infrared sensor overnight while there's no other manned aircraft in the sky um, can actually deliver an incident commander fire line information prior to dawn such that uh, the assets used to suppress the fire um, or evacuations that need to be managed uh, can be executed at daybreak. So uh, this chart is a, a bit of an example of, of where we've applied GIS and specifically Esri and, and a partner named FireWhat to provide incident commanders with this type of real-time uh, emergency response information. There was a TFR established. We've worked very closely with the FAA and, and frankly with the fire response as well as Hurricane Harvey and Irma response. We've seen an amazing ability of the FAA to lean forward and work with industry to um, not just uh, enable industry to utilize drones and UAS assets in the response of the these emergencies, but actually to help participate in the management of that airspace. Um, our incident commander, who is an in-situ employee, uh, was actually the person listed as the TFR owner for a subsection of Port of Corpus Christi, where we were flying under a TFR um, for emergency response. And that's a remarkable thing. Um, and it shows what a professional aviation approach can do in this community when we are all collaborative and focused on safety first. Um, we can start to share resources. We can start to extend um, our capacities to, to do good uh, with unmanned aviation. Um, well, I think with that, I'll probably stop talking uh, and, and let you go eat. But I hope this was useful and something that was interesting to the community to see a real world application of all of the things that we're all working to try to make real on a regular basis. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's in the context of an emergency, but at the same time, uh, an opportunity to learn uh, and exercise some of the things that we're discussing here this week. So thank you very much. All right, another warm round of applause, please, to all of our speakers from the morning, including those that have already sat back down. And thank you to Esri. We will have a nice lunch that is set up out in the foyer. Please, everybody, be back by 1400 in your seats. If you have downloaded the app, 
you will have a reminder that comes directly to you to say it's time to get yourself back into your seat. The speakers for the next session, please be back just a few minutes earlier so we will get you set up. Thank you all. Enjoy your lunch.